Well, I've had a lot of fun these first 10 years. Um, I hope you have too. Um, but it's just the first 10 years, um, first decade. I couldn't possibly have done this without um, the support of the library um, and without Donna Nicely's backing originally and uh, Trisha's backing now. She wants me to continue to do this um, without uh, Ron's help uh, and particularly without Gail and without Chandra and without Christine. This program would never have uh, uh, come about, it wouldn't have carried on, it wouldn't have been run so effectively. So I want to thank all of my library and Vanderbilt colleagues for making all this happen all this time. I, I, I just kind of turn up with a good speaker uh, and everything is done for me. This is, this is going to change. Uh, <laughs> um, and. Um, What's going to happen starting the spring is we are looking for a more diversified sponsorship base. So if any of you have sort of um, husbands or wives who are like bankers or, <laughs> or uh, with guilt um, to assuage or, or lawyers or anything like that, uh, do, do come up uh, and see me afterwards. We, we're looking for either general sponsorship or uh, one session a year or something like that. Um, but I'd be happy to talk about how this, this will happen. But the series is going to go ahead come what may. Uh, and we'll be starting again in February. And um, one change you will notice, so in, enjoy this seat that you're in now, is we're going to move to the auditorium over there. Better seats um, and the food will be uh, out here beforehand. So it'd be a slight change. It means we don't have to set up the stage every, every time. And it's a very comfortable uh, venue. Um, what else? There will be a, a somewhat slightly different programming. I probably have more exchange between Vanderbilt people and people out there in the community, like the music industry and uh, uh, maybe some politicians and do a bit of grilling of people in public, that sort of thing. Um, so this is not just the end of one thing and the beginning of another, but an opportunity to, to revamp and rethink and relaunch a series which I know you've enjoyed as much as I have. Now, I don't want to steal more time from today's speaker. Um, as you know, this series of talks is advertised as having a philosophical flavor. I like to tease out the more philosophical aspects of questions discussed by my colleagues from right across the academic spectrum. But today's talk will not require any teasing out on my part. It will not merely have a philosophical flavor. For the last talk of this current series, I brought you the chairman of our philosophy department, philosophy professor and political science professor Robert Talese a star of modern political philosophy and one of my smartest and most productive colleagues. He received his PhD from CUNY a mere 10 years ago and he joined us at Vanderbilt shortly afterwards. He's a political philosopher with a special interest in democratic theory and liberalism, especially in what's called deliberative democracy. And he's an expert in American pragmatism, a tradition on which he draws extensively and critically. He's especially interested in the place of argument in political life. How far we can accommodate radical differences in our values, whether we can legitimately appeal to some sort of truth that lies beyond our own particular viewpoint. How democracy can cope with public ignorance. Churchill's quoted as saying that the best argument against democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> The, the limits of tolerance in the face of fanaticism, and as we'll see today, the difficulty of accommodating appeals to faith within a democracy, an issue that's as pressing for us in this country as it is in thinking about the aspirations of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. These are perennial themes dating back to the Greeks, as does democracy itself. They're also hugely topical. Our military 
interventions overseas are justified by the fact or the idea that we'll bring democracy to another region. And yet our own democratic processes seem notoriously to have ground to a halt, if not fatally compromised, by our failure to bring about campaign finance reform. Many of those who present themselves as our potential leaders seem to have just got out of a clown car. <laughs> but what else... <laughs> but, but what else is there? Um, it was again uh, my compatriot Churchill who said that democracy was the worst form of government except all the others that have been tried. <laughs> Rob Talese is a prolific author who's recently been writing a book a year, often in collaboration with our colleague, colleague Scott Aiken. His pluralism and liberal politics will be on the shelves in the spring, I hope on the library shelves here. And it follows reasonable atheism from last year, or from this year, 2011. Democracy and Moral Conflict, 2009. Pragmatism, A Guide for the Perplexed, 2008. And A Pragmatist Philosophy of Democracy, 2007, where he supports uh, Peirce's epistemological account of democracy against that of John Dewey. And this basically argues, and, and uh, Rob, you'll have to correct me if I get this wrong, um, that it's not so much that democracy is a good thing for one reason or another, but that our everyday way of understanding what it is even to hold a belief presupposes a democratic space in which beliefs are justified and defended. He's currently working on a book with Scott Aiken about public political argumentation. And in addition to this extraordinary output, and I've only mentioned the books from even the last few years, Professor Talese is editor of a major political science journal, Public Affairs Quarterly, he co-edited The Pragmatist Reader in 2010. You might have wondered what he was doing in 2010 because it wasn't a book uh, of his own. <laughs> he organizes influential conferences. He gets interviewed on the radio. He's a blogger. He has a Twitter account. And he hosts a <laughs> podcast. I don't know how he has time to sleep. And I could say more, but I think I've said enough. Um, Rob Talese is a remarkable colleague and an original mind, but I don't want to stand any longer in way of his presentation today on faith in democracy. Please welcome Professor Fulman. Uh, well, thank you so much, and, and uh, thank you, David, and thank you to the folks at the library for organizing uh, this wonderful uh, series. And I'm really honored uh, to be rounding out at least the first decade's worth of programs uh, in the series. Um, so let me just uh, begin. Um, so the talk is Faith and Democracy, and I think it's exactly 25 minutes long. Um, but I'm going to time myself on that. Um, so one of the real deep attractions uh, of philosophy for me is that philosophers are expected to uh, challenge orthodoxy. Um, that is, we philosophers, I think David will agree, um, are made very uneasy when we see widespread agreement uh, about important things. Um, and the um, explanation of this uneasiness is not that simply that philosophers like to be jerks or um, like to um, uh, be pains in the neck, although I suspect there is a little of that too. Um, it's that uh, philosophers are convinced that the really important questions are so deep and complicated and complex and difficult that when we see wide sp widespread agreement on a particular idea or ideal or aim or goal, we suspect very strongly, at least we begin to suspect very strongly, that the consensus has been won by some inappropriate means, either by force or intimidation or some form of unthinkingness or irrationality. The job of philosophers, I take it, is uh, to test harmony uh, where it occurs to see if it's legitimate and appropriate, um, and if it's not, to disrupt it. Um, and this calling is, I think, the most precious of our inheritances from Socrates, who is in many ways the father of us all. Now, in the past 100 years, uh, or maybe a little bit longer than that, um, one of the things of which there's grown a widespread consensus that might trouble us is um, the consensus on democracy. That is, um, 
We now tend to think that uh, democracy is the name of all that is right and good and beautiful in the political world. Um, and uh, I, I had in here a note about the Winston Churchill uh, quip about democracy being the worst form of government except for all the others. And it's interesting that you know, we, 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 we hear the joke um, and we appreciate the wit, but one of the interesting things about the Churchill claim is that when you think of its substance or what's driving it, it might strike you as, um, in fact, a little bit alien in the following respect. Um, the Churchill quip sort of uh, articulates the thought that democracy is the best we can get. But I take it that we, for many of the reasons Dave was identifying, David was identifying uh, in his uh, very generous introduction, I take it that we think that democracy is just better than the best we can get. I think we're inclined these days to think that democracy is the best there could be. Um, again, that democracy is not just the thing you put up with because everything else is worse, but that democracy is the name of everything uh, that's right and good and just in the world, uh, at least the political world. And um, holding that view of democracy, that it's the best there could be, uh, it plays a crucial role in explaining why we see fit um, to sacrifice so much for it and to push so much for it. Uh, people right now are sacrificing and, and, and struggling at great expense to themselves and the people they love for democracy. And as David also mentioned, uh, we in the United States tend to think that it's worth struggling and sacrificing on behalf of others so that they might enjoy democracy in the way that we do. Um, now, maybe this widespread um, uh, loyalty and embracing of democracy is justified, but as a philosopher, my job is to say, maybe not. Um, now, let me say something I take will be reassuring. Uh, I am a believer in democracy. This talk is not going to be to trash democracy, but it rather is to um, aimed at rather uh, presenting what I take to be a very deep, troubling, puzzle about democracy. Maybe it's even a problem internal to democracy or a tension within our thinking about democracy. Um, and I want to pr present this puzzle or this problem, try to sketch a solution to it, but uh, I'm in a way looking, uh, hoping for some help because uh, the solution that I pose, although I think it's the best one uh, that I am able to find or maybe the best one simply out there, the solution to this puzzle that I'm going to present strikes me as not obviously successful. And this is a problem that keeps me up at night because I think that if the solution to the problem I'm about to describe, uh, if there's no good solution to it, I think that maybe our uh, loyalty to democracy is uh, folly. Um, so to begin then, um, philosophers often insist that uh, discussions of this kind begin with definitions and I'm not going to haggle over the definition but try to say something about what I mean by democracy that um, will sound familiar and, and not worth contesting to you um, uh, as just a way of setting up the problem. Um, if you've got a, uh, some questions about what democracy is, uh, we, can, we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, so by democracy, I mean what uh, political philosophers call constitutional democracy. And by constitutional democracy, uh, we mean um, a political order that roughly instantiates four commitments. Um, the first of these is a commitment to equality. That is, democracy is committed to the thought that all citizens are political equals. This means that all citizens share political power as equals. Um, there are no, in the political world at least, no natural hierarchies. Uh, nobody is by nature subordinate to another in the political world if we're talking about democracy. So after equality, then secondly, accountability. Accountability is the commitment to the thought that government is accountable to the citizens. We are, after all, citizens rather than subjects of our government. Um, uh, and that means in part that the action of our government or the policies enacted by our government has to in some way, uh, this, is tricky, uh, this is a tricky business in political science, but in some way reflect the will of the people who are governed by it. So after equality and accountability, the third commitment is majority rule. And majority rule is the commitment that says that collective political decisions, uh, actions by the government have to in some way be made by means of regular, fair, and open elections uh, in which citizens, again, uh, as equals or as political equals, uh, uh, get an equal amount of input into the decision-making process. This is usually the one man, one, or one person, sorry, one vote rule. And the majority rules. 
No one has veto power over all the others. Um, so after equality and accountability and majority rule, the, the final uh, element of constitutional democracy, democracy as I'll be using the term here, is liberty. Uh, and liberty is the commitment that says that um, even political majorities, even vast political majorities, even vast democratically informed uh, and constituted political majorities are constrained by the rights of individuals. That is to say, there are some things that even vast majorities can't get, no matter how badly they want it or how vast their numbers are. Uh, namely, even vast majorities cannot violate individual rights. And this idea of individual rights, again, would be familiar to you uh, from the uh, Bill of Rights in our Constitution, which are protections uh, in many ways against, you know, protections of the individual against the will of the majority. Now, to be clear, um, this final element, the liberty uh, element, is what makes constitutional democracy constitutional. And the first three elements, equality, accountability, and majority rule, are the more familiar, uh, just straightforwardly democratic elements. But um, in philosophy, it's often the case that once we find a position that has several parts, philosophers are trained to start looking for possible conflicts between the parts or ways in which the parts don't hang together. And uh, it seems clear to me that um, of these four commitments, uh, the possibility for conflict between the first three and the fourth, uh, um, the possibility for conflict of that sort are, are, are pretty obvious uh, and uh, maybe uh, pretty vast. Um, and let me just say what I have in mind. Um, the liberty commitment of democracy involves uh, what we might call, very broadly speaking now, the liberty of conscience. Um, that is, we think that what democracy has to recognize and what uh, individuals must be protected against is, um, is encroachments uh, uh, on um, the ability of each individual to live according to his own judgments about what's most important in life. That is to say that the liberty of conscience is the liberty that each of us has to pursue, as John Stuart Mill put it, our own good in our own way, to decide for ourselves on the basis of our own judgments what makes a life successful, what's really, really important in life, whether to worship a god or not worship a god, and if we're going to worship a god, which one and how and how often and in what way. It seems to me that this is a crucial, the liberty of conscience, as I've just described, is a crucial element of any society that claims to be democratic. And in fact, I would argue in a different context that the liberty of conscience is central to all the other liberties that we're really interested in, the freedom of the press, the freedom of speech, uh, uh, freedom to assemble, uh, the, all the First Amendment rights for sure, have at the core the uh, interest in protecting individuals' uh, ability to live life as they see fit. Of course, it should be added that the liberty of conscience is constrained by, very broadly, by the idea that you have to also recognize other people's uh, freedom to live as they see fit. So there are certain kinds of constraints that we operate under. But nonetheless, this seems to me to be a crucial uh, plank of any viable conception of democracy. Um, but here's the potential for conflict. Um, liberty requires some range of, uh, some very broad range of um, uh, a, a sphere in our lives where we get to live according to our own lights and our own judgments. But democracy is a political system in which we collectively make rules that we all are bound to. So it seems as if one of the intrinsic elements of democracy or one of the things that's at the core of any democratic society is there's a vote. The major the, if the, the, the election is fair, one person, one vote, the majority rules, but then there's a, always a minority, a group of people who uh, voted against the prevailing proposal. And when you voted against the prevailing proposal, you are forced, democracy says, you are required, democracy says, to abide by the decision that you did not favor. So it looks as if at the heart of democracy, there is a requirement for some of us, when we find ourselves in the minority, to be specific, to live according to rules that we cannot endorse or we might even oppose. And so it looks as if democracy has built into it a kind of tension between majority rule and equality and accountability and this freedom to live as we see fit. Now, in ordinary contexts, like um, if there's an election for city dog catcher and you don't win, um, someone might say, well, them's the breaks. You know, uh, you win some, you lose some. It might even be in more important contexts, like you're voting for who should occupy a certain important political role, such as President of the United States, where your candidate doesn't win. And um, in order to reconcile yourself to that fact, someone might say, reconcile you to that fact, someone might say, 
Well, uh, you can't always get what you want. Try again in four years. Keep plugging away. And these kinds of responses, I think, are sufficient to um, reconcile us to the fact that sometimes we have to live in accordance with rules that we did not make or don't favor. But the you can't always get what you want response seems to run into trouble once we recognize that democracy is not always a matter of deciding what we want out of the political world. That is to say, democracy is often a matter in, uh, or uh, um, uh, an affair in which we're required to vote and act and engage in the social world in ways that have at their center our deepest moral commitments, not simply our preferences, right? Our deepest sense of justice and goodness and right uh, and the rest. And in these cases, um, someone says, well, you, you lost the vote, but you can't always get what you want. You might be tempted to say, this was not about things I want. This, is, these are, this was about things that I think are required by justice and goodness. And the result that democracy produces sometimes will strike us as not only unfortunate and not the one we favored, but actually unjust or in some way evil. So it seems that when we're forced to live by rules, not only rules that aren't the ones that we chose, but rules that we actually think are morally worth opposing, we don't only just sort of feel dissatisfied. We feel like we're being forced to betray something in ourselves. We feel like we're being forced to live according to values that aren't just not the ones that we favor, but are the kinds of values that we in fact think are morally worth opposing. And that seems um, unacceptable. Or at least it seems that democracy is making a requirement on us that is problematic. Now, um, it seems that uh, um, when we talk about liberty of conscience, we're talking in part about values and ways of life that are informed by religious convictions. And it seems natural, in fact, it would seem crazy not to expect the following, that when citizens are trying to decide questions about justice and right and good, they turn to their religious convictions for guidance. Um, and when they turn to their religious convictions for guidance, they find often uh, a very rich set of traditions of moral prescriptions and very sensible thoughts about justice and the rest. Um, but here's the deep problem now, at long last. The accountability condition for democracy, um, that second condition that I mentioned, seems to be a condition which requires that when government acts, it owes you, each and every citizen, an account, or we might call a justification for why it's acting in the way that it's acting. That is, part of what it is for us to be citizens rather than subjects is that we have to be able to see ourselves as in some way authors of our political world or authors of political policy. So when the government does something or requires something of you or enacts a law or a policy, it owes you a reason why it, it's acting as it is and in not some other way. Now it seems that if this attempt to justify public policy is going, this attempt to satisfy the accountability condition, is going to satisfy the equality condition, the first condition we discussed, it looks as if the government, in trying to justify itself to you and its actions to you, has to give a reason to you that you can recognize as a reason. Now let me just sort of flesh that out just a little bit. Contrast, or, or so let's say this, imagine uh, something I'm sure you see, and maybe in the library you see quite often, um, parents sometimes say to their children, when the children say, why, the parent responds, because I said so. Now, you know, we chuckle at this, but what, and rightfully so, but one of the interesting things about the because I said so response is that, in part, when a parent says to a child, because I said so, she, the parent, is affirming a kind of absence of equality. <laughs> among parents and children. That is, uh, when the parent says, because I said so, the parent is reminding her child that they, the parent and the child, are not equal sharers in power, right? And that's, we think, as it should be, given the nature of children and given the nature of parenthood and what it takes to cultivate and uh, raise children. Um, uh, that is that we think it's okay for parents to say to children, because I said so. Imagine, though, if your governor got on television 
and offered that reason as a reason why tax policy was being set as it is, or the roads were being handled in the way, or some deep question about public health was being settled in some particular way. Imagine the President of the United States coming on television and saying, we're going to do Q, whatever that is, policy Q. And the press corps says, oh, why? And he says, because I said so. <laughs> it would strike you as the wrong kind of reason, and a reason that's fundamentally anti-democratic, because it does imply a kind of lack of equality. That is, that the president is able to make the rules, and he doesn't owe you anything by way of an explanation. And um, that's just the way that it is. Now, here's the puzzle, then. <laughs> if government action in order to be uh, uh, properly democratic has to be justifiable to each and every citizen, such that the government can't just say, because I said so. Um, it looks also as if when the government is enacting policy, if it says, because the Bible said so, it's making the same kind of mistake. And this is the reason why, right? In a democracy, in a free society, in a society that is committed to freedom of conscience, not everybody has to accept the Bible as a morally authoritative document. So when a politician or when the government in some other voice or register says to you, the policy is going to be Q, and you as a citizen say why, for them to say because the Bible says so is like the president saying because I said so. It seems as if it's the same kind of failure of justification. Now here's the deep problem once again. It seems outrageous to imagine that citizens who are free to adopt religious views, to practice their religion, to exercise their religion, would not turn to those convictions in trying to decide how to act as citizens. That is, it looks like part of what it is to freely exercise religion under certain, uh, and many very familiar forms of religious belief, religion doesn't just tell you what's good and right and just, it also tells you how you should behave politically. It tells you what you should strive for in the social world, what kinds of relations should prevail if justice is going to be done in the social world. So it looks as if there's a tension here now between democracy's commitment to accountability, which requires the government to give reasons that everybody can understand, and it looks like religious reasons are not reasons that can apply to everybody or could count as reasons for everybody, and the freedom of conscience, which ensures free exercise of religion. It looks as if, and here's the, the, the tension, uh, democracy is able to satisfy the accountability condition only at the expense of generating for maybe millions of citizens very serious conflicts of conscience, right? It looks as if democracy is requiring citizens to bracket off or disregard their deepest convictions about what's right and good and just in the world when they take up the office of citizenship, when they decide how to vote, when they decide how to advocate, when they decide how to interact socially in political context with others. They have to, it looks as if, somehow uh, uh, renounce their religious conviction. Uh, and the reason, again, just to make it clear is, if it's wrong for the government to legislate on the basis of some religious conviction, like the Bible said it, it would be also wrong for citizens to tell the government what to do by means of their votes using those reasons, right? If it's wrong for someone to do something, it's wrong for you to tell them to do it, right? And that's what voting on the basis of one's religious convictions looks like. Um, this looks, again, just totally unacceptable to me. It seems unacceptable that democracy should uh, require of citizens these deep conflicts of conscience, and it looks like if democracy can't do better than that, democracy is in trouble. So what can be done? Philosophers have suggested all kinds of things ranging from uh, the more polar extreme views that just say, well, religious citizens have to reconcile themselves to the fact that democracy is secular, full stop, to on the other side of the pole, uh, these more populist views. Majority rule just means democracy, democratic governments do whatever the people say they should do no matter what. And if uh, people want to say that um, uh, the, the, the laws that are, or the, the moral prescriptions that are laid out in the Bible are what the government must do, well, then the government has to do that. Both of these uh, polar positions, though, seem to me to be unacceptable because they concede that we have to give up something in the, of those four conditions that I laid out if we're going to have a democracy. Um, it seems to me that the only possible solution is a solution which looks to individuals' religious commitments and tries to formulate religious reasons from inside of those commitments for individuals who are religiously convicted to constrain the role of their religious beliefs in the political world. 
That is, it looks as if the only way to solve this problem is not to give a political response by just saying your religion is not welcome here or to give some other kind of response. It actually requires us to look at religious convictions and try to find within them reasons for separating out religion and politics or the church, church and state. Um, and maybe this can be done. Many religious believers hold some version of the thought that you should treat others as you would have them treat you. And you can imagine a, uh, speaking to a religious person and saying, well, just as you don't want to be ruled by the laws of my religion, right? Uh, I don't want to be ruled by the laws of yours. Uh, maybe we can come to some common ground here. Maybe there are ways to sort of negotiate uh, morally uh, some common ground by which we can govern each other as equals. Um, maybe the value of liberty of conscience itself is important in certain kinds of forms of religious belief such that appealing to that, namely that faith cannot be forced, uh, maybe that's a way to make progress. Um, and no doubt there are other kinds of uh, um, uh, possibilities here. But I worry deeply, I should say, that these kinds of responses are all becoming increasingly and all the more obviously fragile, in, especially in the United States and in our politics, where it looks as if religious conviction is being appealed to more regularly as a way of denying the equality uh, and the equal standing of those who don't share uh, our religious convictions. Um, and it looks as if um, once we understand this point and once we see this tension looming within our democratic politics, the right conclusion to draw is that despite all of the agreement and the consensus, the near universal consensus, even dictators in the world claim or want to say they're democratic, despite all this uh, loyalty to democracy, democracy in, in fact is a very, very fragile commitment. It depends on our ability to be able to see each other as political equals, equal sharers in political power, despite the fact that we also see each other, at least some of, uh, uh, some of us see each other and some of us see certain others of us as people who are seriously wrong about the most important things in the world, like religion. Um, when seen in this light, democracy, I think our commitment to, to democracy can at best be tentative. Uh, it's a hope, and uh, maybe in that respect it's a kind of of, of faith in the ability of people of different and opposed faiths to nonetheless see each other as fellow moral agents. Thank you. Well, so many so many great, great ideas and um, raised so many questions in, in my mind, I'm sure in yours too. Uh, perhaps I could just start out with uh, not so much a softball, but a sort of way of uh, opening this question up. Um, I noticed that after Obama's Thanksgiving speech, in which apparently he didn't use the word God uh, at all, uh, there was a lot of um, reaction, uh, well, not a lot of reaction, but a reaction from people who like to see their reactions noted. Um, um, that, that, that he should have done that. Um, and, you know, I, I, found that, I found that sort of fascinating, uh, that there was, because the implication was that perhaps that he was not a God-fearing man, or that he wasn't representing uh, the, uh, the Christian uh, or religious aspirations or commitments of the American people adequately, and that at Thanksgiving he should be doing that? I mean, is, is there a, a way of uh, understanding the response that would not be charging those who objected to the absence of God with being fanatics? Yeah, well, um, okay, sorry. Um, it's a very, very strange phenomenon that's very uh, prevalent, at least in this country, but I suspect um, uh, in many parts of the world, that we expect our political uh, representatives to use a certain kind of language on these kinds of occasions, religious language, even though we recognize that it would be in, we hope uh, many of us recognize that it would be inappropriate for the president to say, um, to make mention of God and to say, oh, and by the way, by God, I mean, and then say something very particular, very specific about a particular interpretation of God. That is, we think that 
Uh, once the, pres the president should be using religious terms, but should leave it open to each of his hearers to put in the details about what those terms mean. Now, I find this very, very puzzling because it seems to me that um, uh, if I were a religious believer, I would find this objectionable. I would think that if you're going to start talking about God, but not affirm that you mean the true God, then you are, in fact, doing something that looks cheap and opportunistic. You're trying to win yourself over, or trying to get, on, you can get me on your side by speaking a language, but not telling me what you mean so that I then get to fill in the details. But there's a good chance that when uh, the president uses the word God, he doesn't mean what a lot of you think of when you hear the word. But we nonetheless insist on it. And this is a way, I think, of trying to get uh, a, a reconciliation between a, um, uh, a kind of uh, a commitment to religion that doesn't divide us. Um, and I think that's a very, very difficult thing to achieve. So I, I was interested too in the, in the idea that there um, there might be uh, we you might have such strong convictions whether moral or religious that you really couldn't uh, accept uh, losing an election, for example, if the consequence of that would be that those really serious um, con convictions or commitments would be uh, trampled in the dust. And I, I wondered if you could comment on a slightly different case, um, which is not about deep beliefs and commitments, but uh, something that really interests me. And that has to do with global warming, uh, which to me is not a you know, religious commitment or a moral conviction. It's just something that I think is clearly going to happen if we don't you know, all pull together and all here is international, not just national. And it looks as if the democratic process is such that it will prevent action from being taken. Now, at this point, you can, and, and you could do this, and, and I could do this, construct an argument which would justify acting outside the democratic process if you thought, if you were convinced uh, that that process would not prevent disaster from happening. I mean, you could imagine all kinds of scenarios that you imagine, you know, We've all agreed that we're going to let this vehicle, you know, drive towards the cliff. <laughs> but you know it's got no brakes. Right. <laughs> or you know the driver's drunk. And you just can't persuade other people this is the case. But, you, but it is the case. And, and you could stop that vehicle from going over the cliff. I mean, are there arguments like that that would justify uh, terrorist actions or ways of trying to... Uh, dramatically change a situation that democracy otherwise couldn't meet. For example, you couldn't do it quickly enough, or you couldn't persuade right. the powers. I mean, you can see the sort of question yeah, I'm asking. Absolutely. And I think that the, um, the, 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 the role of religious belief in politics is a sort of smaller version of, I think, a much broader set of concerns about democracy, which is uh, exactly as you're saying, David, there are certain contexts in which uh, one might feel uh, fully justified in thinking that unless a certain action politically is taken, some disastrous result is going to ensue, and democracy just doesn't seem to have the power. This is often, by the way, thought to be one of the virtues of democracy. It doesn't seem to be able to work and to enact things swiftly. There's a lot of thinking and lobbying and voting and things that go on, but in some cases there are emergencies where it looks as if unless something happens, there's going to be a major disaster of some sort that everybody would want to avert. Um, and so the question then is why sustain democratic commitments when it comes to figuring out how to enact social change when it looks as if democracy is too clumsy an instrument? And I think, uh, again, this is part of the sort of thing that keeps me up at night, I think that under certain of these scenarios, uh, maybe global warming is among them. Uh, maybe um, uh, um, when, when we were concerned about uh, uh, nuclear war, uh, this is another case in which it looks as if it would be very hard to make a good philosophical case for uh, uh, sustaining democratic commitments when it looks as if that's going to make it much more likely that something terrible is going to happen. Now, with the global warming kind of case, I think there's an additional uh, worry here, which is not only that um, 
uh, will have a hard time convincing all the people who have vested interests in denying this thing or not accepting it or not fully acknowledging it uh, uh, to, to accept the, the facts. Um, but global warming is also, as you point out, David, a uh, international problem. The solution cannot be uh, enacted by a particular group of people in a particular country. If there's going to be a solution or a kind of resolution or action, it requires the actions of several people from different kinds of countries. And one of the, uh, in different countries, one of the interesting and maybe one of the limitations of democracy is that it looks as if democracy is always indexed to a particular population, usually in a particular geographical location. But we know in environmental cases that um, what the United States does or what China does or what some other country does in its environmental policy can deeply affect, for, for bad, uh, for worse, uh, the lives of people living elsewhere who have no say in how those governmental policies get made. So it looks as if there's an intrinsic boundedness of democracy that makes it almost the wrong instrument to take up when you're thinking about uh, matters of global or international justice. It's a very, very deep problem. If, you know, if I had the, a really strong uh, solution to these sorts of things, uh, you know, um, I would be very happy, but unfortunately. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, cut my remarks short and open this up to the discussion, discussion up to, the, to the, uh, the audience here. And we're going to give ourselves, for the first time ever, five more minutes uh, we're going to end at five past one, break the time rule, <laughs> so that we have a, a proper discussion. So, uh, yes. If you, eliminate a speak, the, mic. if you eliminate the operation of democracy, aren't you getting back to the parent-child paradigm where you're saying that this group of people's opinion is more important than that group's opinion. Um, so perhaps, I, I, I didn't know that we were arguing for the elimination of anything uh, in democracy. Um, so uh, let me affirm again, uh, I am a believer in democracy. Um, I do think though that um, part of what it is to be a believer in democracy is to think seriously about some of the limitations and difficulties that exist in democracy. As I think that it's, um, uh, it's problematic from the point of view of a believer in democracy to accept democracy as something that um, uh, couldn't be improved or shouldn't be worked on. So I, I wouldn't argue that we should eliminate democracy, uh, but I also would argue that um, we need to recognize and feel the philosophical force of some of the problems uh, so that we can try to work on a democratic solution to them. Thank you. Uh, this is the lady in the middle here, Aaron. Yeah, there's a mic just coming by. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, is there room in your democracy, in your conception of democracy, for a religious sub community where the people all live together? and they want to be exempt from general laws because in some way it conflicts with their religious commitments. Uh, they want the uh, uh, option of living by their own religious convictions. They're not trying to impose their views on anyone else, but they do want this exemption. So I'm thinking of Amish communities who want to pull their children out of school early, fundamentalist Mormon communities who want to uh, institute polygamy only among themselves. Uh, well, I think those are two very different kinds of cases. I think you'll agree with me. Okay, um, because of the, the part about the polygamy, which introduces all kinds of in uh, interesting issues about equality, for example. The Amish case, I think, is, is fairly s simple or straightforward. It's not simple, it's straightforward. In that, um, I think that in, in, in the famous Yoder case, where uh, Amish communities argued with the Supreme Court, in the Supreme Court uh, for exemptions from... Um, certain kinds of rules about how long children had to stay in public schools. The Amish communities were arguing uh, in Wisconsin that uh, if the children were forced to stay in school until they're 16, we would lose all their labor for the farms. This would undermine our traditional way of life. We want an exemption. Um, I think that in the Amish case, uh, give, granting the exemption is, is, is probably justified. Uh, uh, but also I think that it's a crucial element of the Amish case that part of 
what that religious community is interested in is a general withdrawal from the Office of Citizenship as such, right? Um, which makes the Amish case different from what we sometimes think of as the straightforward fundamentalist case, where there's a, an argument that's being made for some kind of exemption or some kind of accommodation without the idea that they are a community that is, as it were, uh, not fully uh, taking on the role of citizen. Um, and I think those cases are much more tricky. But I think the polygamy case is a straight case in the other direction. That is that once you're talking about uh, instituting for religious reasons policies that seem, empirically speaking, to be so good at introducing other kinds of social inequality, uh, I think that there is a, an additional set of considerations which tips the scale in the other direction. But I think it's important to say that these kinds of cases um, where we're talking about exemptions are philosophically distinct from the kinds of cases where we're talking about religious reasons for justifying policy. I think those are distinct. Uh, and the story that I would tell uh, uh, in the exemption cases is a little bit more piecemealy. And let's look at the different kinds of values at, case, uh, at stake and take the cases one by one. Lady in, in uh, right here. All right. Uh, yes, I've heard it uh, on behalf of the idea of having a bright line between church state um, that one reason is that uh, some religious denominations um, or, you know, sects, fundamentalist sects of denominations tend to be rather more comfortable with coercion right. in the field of religion uh, as far as persuading others to join their their religion, that they're not uncomfortable with heavy persuasion or coercion to get people to join the religion and also to stay. Um, so I'm wondering what you think of this argument. Um, well, uh, so I, I think that you're right that um, there are religious sects or um, sects that we might even uh, uh, sort of uh, decline to call religious, so if you think about cults, right, kind of cult cases, right, um, where it's very, very difficult, uh, or, and, but yet very important to make a distinction or to draw the right distinction between persuasion and encouragement and proselytizing and coercion. That is, I think that in these kinds of cases, precisely what's at stake is how we make this distinction between sort of um, uh, 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 trying to persuade you to join us and forcing you to join us. And one of the interesting um, elements of this, or one of the, 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 the elements of these kinds of cases that make things a little bit easier is uh, cases in which it looks like once you're in, you're not allowed to leave or it's really hard to get out. Um, there's, by the way, a great film at the Bell Court called uh, Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, which is about this, uh, which I would encourage you to see if you haven't seen it. I think it does a good job at this. Um, but that's not only a church state issue, because even if we had a religious uh, group that um, we thought was employing inappropriate means to get members and to keep them, even if that group were not politically active or politically engaged, I still think there would be a state interest in intervening uh, in these kinds of cases, not because they're likely to violate the separation of church and state or not recognize that state and church are separate, but simply because they're engaging in acts which mistreat citizens, right? Uh, deny certain kinds of crucial liberties to citizens. Now, there are all kinds of cases in which a, a constitutional democratic state has to recognize that certain cultural and social groups within the democratic state can be gov governed by uh, non-democratic rules, right? Church, well, the Catholic Church is a good example of this, right? The state allows there to be communities of Catholics uh, within uh, uh, the United States, recognizes that the Catholic Church has rules about who can be a priest, for example, which would not fly <laughs> uh, outside of that institution, right? Women can't be priests, um, but has to accommodate them on liberty of conscience grounds and that um, uh, membership in these groups is voluntary and exit is possible. Once you get into cases where membership starts looking like it's a little bit involuntary or forced and exit looks 
like it's greatly discouraged or blocked, then I think no matter what you want to say about the church state issues, you've got a, a case for a government intervention. Okay, I think we have another question in the back there. Back here. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Hi. Um, my question is, um, I, I think there are definitely aspects of religion that are rules-based, if you will, that grow out of beliefs of religion. But I think there are things that get classed as religion that are actually a worldview of people who follow a particular, who, who end up being participants in a religion, but that aren't religion per se. Right. Um, and I get um, frustrated at times in conversations like these um, because I feel like there's an assumption that um, some sort of pre-religious human is the pure human, and that um, a worldview that has religious aspects to it has been placed on top of that. Um, and so people with a religious worldview are asked to set aside their beliefs, while um, those with an irreligious worldview um, are not, as though that is the more, um, formative, the, the, the base beginning place. Um, but that to me creates um, an inequality that you mentioned um, and suggests that there's a hierarchy that the religion is the second place added on category. And so I just, it's, you know, adds to the tension of what you've described and wondered how you respond. Well, that, so that is, that's just another way of, of, of proposing what I think is this very deep, serious problem, right? It does look as if, um, uh, constitutional democracy has built within it some conception of uh, what could possibly count as a good reason for the government to do something, which has built into it the idea, well, the Bible said it, or, you know, the Pope said it, or Jesus said it, right? These aren't going to be reasons that the government can recognize. Um, and I think that you're right. This is a real deep philosophical problem uh, when we're interested both in accountability and the liberty of conscience. Um, one sort of, which is why the, the, the kind of solution I was trying to, uh, I think is the only possible solution, is to try to find within the religious convictions of various citizens motivation from the religious values for introducing a separation of church and state or a constraint on the roles that religious values can play in, um, in politics. I suggested that this is, looks to me like the only solution, but it's totally fragile. Um, and I can understand and uh, know people who would say, nope, when you got the truth, that's what the political, about justice, that's what the political world has to do. And the truth about justice comes from, you know, this book or this pastor. And if the government isn't going to do what that person or that book says, the government doesn't have any claim to my allegiance. We know people who say this sort of thing. It's hard to know what can be said, and you don't want the answer to be, well, then we just fight. <laughs> right? Uh, and and there's, there's a gentleman back there, and then there's a lady back there. And that's just the order in which I saw those hands. I was just going to ask you the question. So some of our... Some of the foundational documents. Some of the foundational documents intimate more of maybe a religious basis for human rights. And for that reason, my ultimate question, which is my study of human rights, uh, which is basically the, uh, behind what seems to be the problem between equality and liberty of conscience, right? There's the human, even detail into it. So if human rights is not based on a divine or a sanctity of life type of issue, um, if it's not based there, then what is human rights based in? And how would you set up a, a framework of government if, if, if human rights was not based in those types of things? Like what is it based in? And how do we, how do we divine those things out of the situation? Can, can you make your answer really brief? Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> That's a very, very good question. I think that uh, folks with um, certain kinds of religious convictions have a much easier time at theorizing human rights than those who want to do so in purely secular terms. Uh, to keep the answer brief, I think it's possible to make a case for human rights that doesn't invoke theological or religious kinds of commitments. I think there is a secular case possible, but it's 
it's a real, it's a trick. It's, it's a much more difficult route to travel than if you could just uh, employ re religious premises. And we're going to have to give the last question to the lady in the red hat back there. All right. I want to go back to the comment that David made about uh, democracy, maybe the way it is when you're strong enough in that uh, global warming thing. But we have a layer of health and protection that most of us ignore, and that is that we live in a federal republic. It's only democratic to the extent that you get to vote for someone who will make decisions for you from information they have access to, which you do not have access to. And the only time that I remember this happening was in World War II, because I'm 79 years old and I can remember it. They made those decisions then. They could do it again. It's not even our business. Everything that goes on, some of the business that goes on is for our own protection. They have access to it, and we don't. Thank you. That's Professor Felice, what do you say? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> I am, I am, I'm, 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 I'm worried about a view which um, cedes to powerful institutions and office holders uh, a position which we uh, a position which we're bound we're required to say that they know better than we do. So um, democracy just means we put people in office and then uh, let them do their job. That strikes me as uh, uh, potentially dangerous. And with that, I think we thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Sorry I went a little bit longer than I thought. No, no, no you didn't. Oh, okay.